Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This is S4A live stream number 60, the big 60, being recorded on November 2nd, 2022. So we have some topics lined up for today's stream. Uh, we have about 40 people, I think, in the chat right now. We've been chatting a little bit before we uh, hit the record button. And I have turned raids off for the stream. So the last stream that went up uh, was an ill-advised third stream of the week. Sometimes those work and sometimes they don't. I think I'm going to be avoiding doing three streams in a week from now on, no matter how much content there is, because, um, yeah, I just don't always have it in me. And then it's stressful and then it takes me a long time to like come down from that third stream and everything. And I think it's it's better to just hold off on that. So I had to edit that stream, like the final product that's up on the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash socialism for all, uh, for live stream 59. I definitely cut some chunks out of that because we had 120 people in the chat at one point and just it was getting a little crazy. So just going to remind everybody who is in the chat right now, don't feed the troll. If a troll comes in like there was one before, uh, don't interact with them. I will eventually uh, catch up with the chat. Yes, Cosmic Protocol Band, this is truly live. Um, so yeah, uh, the chat here, I actually read the whole chat. We interact with it. We have a discussion. So, um, you know, I'd rather have 40 people in the chat and have a real, you know, discussion than have like a million people in the chat and it's just sort of pandemonium. But anyway, there was a... Um, question that came up before we get into even the grab bag of stuff for today. There were a few comments that I wanted to just jump right into. Uh, so Flashy said, quote, MLs who admire trots like Michael Hudson. So first of all, I didn't know uh, Michael Hudson was a trot, if somebody can give background on that. Um, and second of all, so we did a thing about Kautsky's ultra imperialism theory, which Lenin criticized heavily. Basically, Lenin saw it as a way of selling the kind of opportunism that would lead to workers participating in uh, fighting for the bourgeoisie in World War One, of, you know, quote, their uh, various countries, even though it's really the bourgeoisie's um, countries. But anyway, uh, people were talking about how does Michael Hudson's super imperialism idea stack up with this? To be honest, I don't know. I'm not that familiar with the Michael Hudson's work, but anyway, continuing the comment, the dude thinks he is slick pushing the idea of super imperialism and thinks that we won't notice its relation to Kautsky's ultra imperialism. Well, I didn't notice uh, because I'm really not familiar with Hudson's work. However, I do have a video up on the channel. I only have one from Kautsky and it's specifically for criticism purposes. The title of the video is Ultra Imperialism 1914 by Karl Kautsky featuring criticism from V.I. Lenin. So basically this video is um, half of it, or 20 minutes of it, is Ultra Imperialism by Kautsky, and then some comments from me about it, and then pivoting to Lenin. So Lenin wrote the introduction to Bukharin's Imperialism and World Economy in 1915, in which he directly attacks uh, Kautsky's um, theory of ultra imperialism. And basically he calls it opportunism for today, revolution sometime tomorrow. It's a bit reminiscent of the, uh, was it Wimpy from Popeye? Like, I'll gladly pay you Thursday for a cheeseburger today. So um, what did Lenin say? If, if the quote that I'm thinking of is here, then opportunism. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, here's the quote. In his, oh, sorry, in this tendency to evade the imperialism that is here, like here today in the moment that we're looking at, and to pass in dreams to an epic of ultra-imperialism, which Kautsky was theorizing, it could be that after the inter-imperialist wars, there would be some ultra-imperialism in which the imperialists kind of worked out um, a peace among themselves and then sort of peacefully ruled. And it was this theory, and Lenin's like, probably not, but even if so, um, you know, well, actually, uh, skipping back a bit, Lenin says, if it is thus impossible simply, directly, and bluntly to dream of going from imperialism back to, quote, peaceful capitalism, is it not possible to give those essentially petty bourgeois dreams the appearance of innocent contemplations regarding, quote, peaceful ultra-imperialism? So Kautsky was kind of saying, 
oh, we'll get through this war and then maybe the capitalists will figure things out and stop fighting with each other. So anyway, continuing the quote that I began earlier, um, to pass in dreams to an epic of ultra imperialism while evading the imperialism that's right in front of us, of which we do not even know whether it is realizable. This ultra imperialism is basically a hypothetical. There is not a grain of Marxism in this. In this reasoning, Marxism is admitted for that, quote, new phase of capitalism, the realizability of which its inventor, Kautsky himself, fails to vouch for. So Kautsky himself is like selling this opportunism in the face of the imperialism that is right there on the basis that, hey, maybe in the future there will be inter-imperialist peace and capitalism will go into this, quote, new phase. So anyway, uh, the, you know, so the realizability of this ultra-imperialism Kautsky himself fails to vouch for that, whereas for the present, the existing phase of capitalism, obviously emerging imperialism, Kautsky offers us not Marxism, but a petty bourgeois and deeply radical, uh, sorry, blah, blah, deeply reactionary tendency to soften contradictions. There was a time when Kautsky promised to be a Marxist in the coming restless and catastrophic epoch, which he was compelled to foresee and definitely recognize when writing his work in 1909 about the coming war, World War I. Now, when it has become absolutely clear that that epoch has arrived, Kautsky again only promises to be a Marxist in the coming epoch of ultra-imperialism, of which he does not know whether it will arrive. In other words, we have any number of his promises to be a Marxist sometime in another epoch in the future, not under present conditions, not at this moment. For tomorrow, we have Marxism on credit, Marxism as a promise, Marxism deferred. For today, we have a petty bourgeois opportunist theory, and not only a theory, of softening contradictions. It is something like the internationalism for export prevailing in our days among ardent, ever so ardent internationalists and Marxists who sympathize with every expression of internationalism in the enemy's camp, anywhere but not at home, not among their allies, who sympathize with democracy as it remains a promise of their allies, who sympathize the self-determination of nations, but not of those that are dependent upon the nation honored by the membership of the sympathizer. In a word, this is one of the thousand and one varieties of hypocrisy prevailing in our times. So, um, I guess to just finish this out, because it's near the end, Lenin continues, can one, however, deny that in the abstract, a new phase of capitalism following imperialism, namely this phase of ultra-imperialism is thinkable? No. In the abstract, one can think of such a phase. Uh, oh, sorry, that was a very lengthy sentence. So he started, can one deny that it's thinkable? No. You, no, you can't deny. It's a possibility in the future. In the abstract, you can think of such a phase. However, in practice, Lenin continues, they who deny the sharp tasks of today in the name of dreams about soft tasks of the future becomes an opportunist. Theoretically, it means to fail to base oneself on the developments now going on in real life, to detach oneself from them in the name of dreams. Now, what do we get constantly from the multipolarity people? Oh, this is going to make revolution easier in the future. And in the meantime, you're just sucking up to bourgeois nationalism. But do we know for sure that it's going to make revolution easier in the future? No, absolutely not. And there's not nearly enough organizing going on right now. Oh, no, this is going to make it all easier. Again, this is exactly what Lenin was criticizing Kautsky for. It's weird, though, because it's been, you know, it, it's returned history rhymes. Um, and we're ne we now have a very similar thing of this. I mean, you get some pro-USA NATO opportunism from people like Vosch. But then you get other people who are supposed Marxists who are selling you opportunism, but in favor of the Russian bourgeoisie. It's bizarre and disgusting. Anyway, we are going to cover uh, quickly, it's not sort of the main feature of today, but an article about Putin's use of uh, Soviet symbolism in Russian bourgeois propaganda. Actually, you know what, let's just go into that right now, because I was planning on uh, doing it up front anyway. So here we go. This is a courtesy of revolutionarydemocracy.org. And this was originally published in Scintilla, and it's current October 2022, number 127. So this is an article called Putin and Soviet Symbolism. It's just about two and a half pages, so let's get into it. In an article entitled, 
on the situation in Ukraine, which appeared in the Indian magazine Revolutionary Democracy of September 22, Comrade Bikram Mohan, after denouncing the imperialist and aggressive character of the so-called mil uh, special military operation aimed at safeguarding the interests of Russian capitalism in Ukraine, focuses on a specific aspect of Putinist propaganda, the use of pro-Soviet symbols. The question, which obviously, you know, commenting, you see this all over social media, all of these supposed MLs who are like, Putin, uh, you know, oh, I saw a picture of a Russian soldier and he had the, you know, uh, flag of the Russian bourgeoisie, but also uh, an old Soviet thing. You know, USSR 2.0 is right around the corner. No, you're a fucking dupe. You're a complete dupe, and there's just nothing more to it than that. Continuing. The question deserves to be investigated, both for the causes and consequences that it entails, and because various fellow travelers are trapped and confused by this propaganda. Um, by the way, fellow traveler is a long-standing slang term in socialist communist literature for somebody who's not a member of a party, but is sympathetic to and sort of uh, travels in those circles, so to speak. Comrade Bikram rightly observes that after 30 years of devastating reforms, vast strata of the Russian popular masses show understanding and admiration for the Soviet past. So there's nostalgia. Of particular importance in modern Russian ethos and national pride is the victory over Nazi Germany and European fascism achieved with the Great Patriotic War, which was led by the Bolshevik Party under the leadership of Stalin. So commenting, the USA does the exact same thing. You watch the History Channel on cable or something like that. It's like the World War II channel. Um, you know, this is like a, a high point where, you know, pure evil was defeated, at least as far as in, you know, USA language. Um, of course, there was a bit more class analysis applied to it in the USSR. But anyway, yeah, that's a source of pride for, uh, for all involved there. Of course, the U.S. then allied with the defeated Nazis um, in a pretty explicit way right after the war. But... Um, they don't highlight that so much on the History Channel. Anyway, the greatness and power of the state, talking about the USSR, that was based on the worker-peasant alliance under the hegemony of the working class, is an irrefutable historical fact with which any bourgeois government in Russia must deal. You have this worker-led history, in other words, that people are proud of. Can you live up to that? How do you deal with that in your bourgeois propaganda about how great your capitalist-led country is when people remember um, what the USSR achieved. It's a problem that the Russian bourgeoisie has to contend with in formulating their nationalism. Continuing, Comrade Bikram rightly observes that after 30 years of devastating reforms, so 91 to today, vast strata of the Russian popular masses show understanding and admiration for the Soviet past. Oh, did I? That's nice. I. Um, clip that one twice. All right. Even Putin, despite being a visceral nationalist and anti-communist, is forced, especially in times of war, to adopt in an open or subliminal way a propaganda based on the victories of the past. Therefore, the memory of the Soviet victory over Nazi fascism has become a central and recurring element of present-day Putinism. The pro-Soviet propaganda element and the appeals to the common anti-fascist sentiment of the oppressed Russian masses are used to carry out a war of an imperialist character, the character of which must be hidden behind the slogans of the demilitarization and, quote, denazification of Ukraine. Undoubtedly, far-right chauvinism and neo-fascist ideology are prevalent in the Ukrainian army, but Putin, Putin's regime is not in a political, ideological, and moral position to denazify both because its aims are oppressive and aimed at denying the self-determination of the Ukrainian nation, because Putin himself has close ties with neo-fascist personalities and organizations, such as Dugin and the Wagner Group, as well as with other far-right organizations. The exchange between the criminals of the Nazi Azov Battalion and the oligarch Medvedchuk is proof of Moscow's lies. Putin is a conscious anti-communist, and his ideology is inherently anti-Soviet and anti-Leninist, as we have demonstrated in several articles published in Scintilla. However, his, quote, liberal attitude, or 
permissive maybe, towards Soviet symbolism and the history of the Soviet Union has spread totally unfounded speculations about an alleged ideological turn. In reality, Putin is opportunistically using the liking of large sections of the Russian people for their Soviet past, for his own political purposes, and for war propaganda. The more the Putinist regime finds itself in difficulty, the more it will get bogged down in Ukraine, and the more often and with greater intensity it will bring out the Soviet symbolism to consolidate and divert the masses that bear the weight of the war. It is therefore no coincidence that in recent months, the red flag symbolizing the victory of the Soviet Union over Nazi Germany, with the Hamel, excuse me, hammer, sickle, and star, has been appearing more and more often. For example, it is exhibited in official military parades and flies on some Russian tanks in Ukraine. The Russian media even highlights the fact that the red flag of victory flies in the cities where the Ukrainian armed forces have been expelled. Even the Russian cosmonauts waved the glorious banner in an operation with a strong symbolic and media impact. With this, Putin wants to convey the idea that the war in Ukraine is an anti-fascist war against a fascist regime supported and armed by the U.S. and E.U., and not an inter-imperialist war in which Russian imperialism is trying to defend by the sword, deals with its sphere of influence and its own market, perpetuating the dependent status of Ukraine, a country disputed for more than a decade between the U.S. and E.U. on the one hand, yeah, I'd say more like two decades at least, and the Russian Federation on the other. Putin must appear as Russia's savior against the aggression of European fascism. At some level, it's positioning itself to be viewed positively, as much as Stalin is considered in Russia today. Therefore, it is of the greatest importance to point out that Putin's ideology and political and strategic goals have nothing to do with the glorious past of the Soviet Union of Lenin and Stalin. But there is another relevant aspect that Comrade Bikram highlights. Putin's regime has allied itself with the heirs of the revisionist CPSU, Communist Party of the Soviet Union, which today are mainly represented by the Communist Party of the Russian Federation, CPRF or KPRF. The CPRF constructs its rhetoric in favor of the unjust war of partition in Ukraine, based on the need to eradicate fascism and Western aggression. Furthermore, the CPRF insists that failing to complete the military operation in Ukraine would have serious consequences for Russia. This is not a coincidence. Revisionism is always on the side of capital and against the interests of the working class, regardless of the historical era or the social stages of development. Today, the CPRF is on the side of Russian capital, just as modern revisionism was against the working class and socialism in the Soviet Union and other Eastern Bloc countries. The CPRF like other revisionist parties, does not recognize Russian imperialism because it is its permanent ally. Support for Putin's war effort is support for the destructive and aggressive character of imperialism. This has nothing to do with the struggle to rebuild the Soviet Union of Lenin and Stalin. The revisionists of today have allied themselves with the Putin regime and support an imperialist war in which Russians and Ukrainians are being killed by the tens of thousands, creating irreparable damage to thousands and millions of other people an unspeakable suffering that is imposed in the name of the political, economic, and strategic interests of the opposing imperialisms. The Soviet flag of victory has nothing to do with this dirty war. Just to add here, there's another screen, but um, if I'm not mistaken, the Z symbol is also um, another reference to the victory over Nazism back in World War II. Again, this is like what the U.S. has been doing for some time. Russia hasn't launched a war like the, quite like this on this scale um, since reverting to open capitalism, you know, post-1991. Uh, but the U.S. has been doing this for a while. Like, if you remember the Iraq War, they tried to, you know, make it out that Saddam Hussein was like the Hitler of the Middle East, etc. They always use this, like whatever is a source of pride, whatever is popular, they always just drag it out for bourgeois, nationalistic, imperialistic purposes. So... You know, stop falling for it, for fuck's sake. This is like pretty basic communist stuff. So anyway, there must be no ambiguity in the struggle against the inter-imperialist war. Appealing to the pro-Soviet and anti-fascist sentiments of the Russian masses is a false and dishonest political and propaganda act, and as such must be denounced and exposed. Putin and the revisionists are misappropriating the symbols 
and glorious history of the socialist Soviet Union, exploiting the just aspirations of vast Russian social strata who do aspire to social emancipation, peace, and the brotherhood of peoples, which Lenin, Soviet Union, and Stalin had won. Aggression against Ukraine is not in the interests of the Ukrainian people, much less the Russian working class. It is therefore up to the communists, Marxist-Leninists of each country, to reveal the true class nature of the treacherous Putinist and revisionist propaganda, to explain to the working class and the popular masses that behind the symbolism there are capitalist relations of production and an imperialist war of partition, to openly fight the social, excuse me, to openly fight the social chauvinist positions. Putin's regime needs to use Soviet symbols and anti-fascism to justify war. Uh, sorry, let's take that one again. Putin's regime. Okay. Putin's regime's need to use Soviet symbols and anti-fascism to justify war represents a contradiction that highlights the weakness of Putinism. But it also expresses an important change in the attitude of the oppressed Russian masses toward the victories of the socialist Soviet Union. While the neoliberal model adopted by Putin is in serious crisis, aggravated by Western sanctions. The war in Ukraine will only accelerate the bankruptcy of the Putinist regime and capitalism in Russia. At the same time, it will bring about the revolution which will liberate Russia from capitalism and imperialism again, rebuilding proletarian socialism. So this is the thing, end of article, um, you know, the capitalists have gotten themselves into this position again, rebuilding capitalism in Russia uh, and, you know, taking it to a higher level. It is imperialist. It's highly consolidated, monopoly stage, exporting capital on down the line. And, um, you know, it's unfortunate to see so many people just lapping up the absolute propaganda uh, level understanding that is propagated on places like Twitter and other social media. It's something that I think these people sometimes stumble onto S4A on YouTube or whatever, and they're shocked. They've, you know, never encountered this before. Everybody that they know who encounter, who calls themselves uh, Marxist, Marxist-Leninist, is completely in step with this Russian bourgeois propaganda for their war. And uh, that, that just isn't the case at all. I don't know who taught you socialism, but that's not how it works at all. Um, but yeah, they, they've gotten themselves, the Russian bourgeoisie, into this position where, you know, war, it's always a risk. You're putting weapons in the hands of working class people and hoping that they don't turn them on you. They're hoping that you uh, turn them on other workers. This is obviously the thing, you know, revolutionary defeatism. It's the defeat of all bourgeois governments. It's don't fight for the bourgeoisie, fight against the bourgeoisie. It's happened before, specifically in Russia and Ukraine. It's happened before. They have had a socialist revolution before. It's time to do it again. It's time to do it across the entire world. So anyway, uh, thanks for the comment. And, uh, you know, that led into something I was wanting to talk about today. All right. Question, why do you think some of the left dismiss fascists as, quote, stupid when some of the most uh, scary fascist politicians and thinkers were former Marxists? Um, not really. I mean, Mussolini had been a socialist previously, and then he started working for MI5 and clearly abandoned socialism. Uh, Hitler was not a Marxist, and so on, so... Um, anyway, uh, so why do some on the left dismiss um, fascists as, like, stupid or, I guess, incompetent? I don't know. I, I don't. I think that it's a mistake to... Uh, so, in other words, I, I would, you know, question some of how the question was phrased. But, um, yeah, I mean, sometimes you like you saw this with uh, Bush and Cheney in the 2000s. So this was a fairly severe right turn in already right wing U.S. politics at the time. But, um, you know, George W. Bush was put up as a kind of stupid front man. Also, people like Donald Trump, Obama, it was a different tactic. He was, you know, smart and charming and young and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, you can't dismiss you can't dismiss fascists as just stupid. Uh, some of them are very ignorant, but not all of them really are well read or educated on Marxism. So, um, 
Yeah, I don't know. I, I agree and disagree there, I guess. But yeah, don't underestimate fascists for sure. So. Hudson owns the rights to the works of Trotsky after Trotsky's widow, widow died. I did not know that. Uh, he's a campist with no knowledge of Lenin's theory of imperialism and outright rejects the fact that class struggle is the main contradiction in conventional capitalist society. Well, I guess there's a reason I wasn't following him, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so see a troll that needs to be uh, escorted out. There you go. All right. You know, I think it's sad. The troll came in with a, basically a KYS and it's like, you know, if you're... Um, like I'm going to listen to some random words on the screen from some troll. If you're in a position where that kind of online verbal attack from somebody is really affecting you deeply, it's time to log off for a while, really. Uh, you know, touch grass is usually used as a dismissive way, but I mean, truly develop more offline interests. Like, I don't know, you know, somebody sees fit to come into a stream and just start blasting, like, uh, you know, encouraging suicidal behavior um i don't know who that's exactly affecting but it's not really going to do much here except get you kicked out of the chat what makes someone a trot adhering to trotskyism which is uh we'll discuss some other time but yeah basically there was a um power struggle in the ussr after lenin's death some two of the main contenders were trotsky and stalin stalin obviously won the struggle trotsky was uh, not a good sport about it. and But I mean, even prior to this, Lenin wrote a lot against Trotsky, who had been a Menshevik for a long period of time, became a Bolshevik kind of like really towards the end. And um, Trotsky had, you know, a long history of being all over the place. And Lenin did so, you know, uh, just go to the S4A YouTube channel, search for Lenin on Trotsky. I forget the name of the thing, but it was like, an hour of just kind of skewering Trotsky. And, um, you know, Trotsky did make major contributions to the Russian Revolution, but was not on the most solid ideological ground for most of the time that he was participating in the entire movement. And that just needs to be recognized. But it's also, um, you know, they'll criticize Stalin for having like a cult of personality. Trotsky, my God, it's 2022, they won't let it go. You know, and it doesn't really stand for anything except for Trotsky himself. Oh, look at how they treated my man Trotsky, etc. You know, so uh, not a fan. They're also, in my experience, some of the most sectarian people um, around. My first real life experience with socialists was with Trots. It honestly put me off to getting more involved with socialism for a while. Actually, also. I was just watching the live stream, which I um, promoted in the community tabs yesterday, Paul and Kaz, who is an older um, Marxist channel, uh, hasn't made content for like seven months, but did a live stream yesterday with Jacobin, and they were talking about their experience in forming a union in a factory. Anyway, I was chatting with Paul and Kaz for a minute there, and he was saying that the union organizer with the Brotherhood of Machinists, I forget exactly what union it was, uh, they told the union rep guy that was like coordinating with them on the organizing that they were socialists. And the guy was like scared at first because of previous experiences. And I was like, what were the previous experiences did he tell you? And um, apparently it was like, he had some trots in his union who were like yelling at him, calling him like a class traitor and stuff. So. Uh, trots. I just, I just can't. Um, yeah. Continuing. I saw a multipolarista video a while ago, that's Ben Norton's channel, that Hudson was linking the 2019 repo crash to the COVID bailout. I can see how capitalism would want to cover up another crash, but I'm still waiting for some more proof. Fair. No, I'm not going to read fascist works. It's a fair point, but I think it would attract utterly the wrong people to the channel. So, no, I don't want that. Peace between imperialists is impossible. One either destroys the rest for a time until another country reaches the imperialist stage, or there's a constant battle. As far as we know, yes. 
And this was the point of what Lenin was saying to Kautsky. Is it possible that in the future there would be some other phase of imperialism? Yeah, it's possible. But um, you can't sell, you know, opportunism today and Marxism hypothetically in the future. You have to deal with the imperialism that's actually in front of you. The question has only to be presented clearly for any other than a negative answer to be impossible. This is because the only conceivable basis under capitalism for the division of spheres of influence, interests, colonies, etc., is a calculation of the strength of those participating, their general economic, financial, military strength, etc., and the strength of these participants in the division does not change to an equal degree for the even development of different undertakings, trusts, branches of industry, or countries is impossible under capitalism. This is a Lenin quote. Half a century ago, Germany was a miserable, insignificant country if her capitalist strength is compared with that of the Britain of that time. Japan compared with Russia in the same way. Is it conceivable that in 10 or 20 years' time, the relative strength of the imperialist powers will have remained unchanged? It is out of the question. So, yeah, um, it's there. I mean, it's might makes right, basically, between the imperialists. So, you know, things shift between them as the competition for resources and profits has its ups and downs. But, yeah, this is all we've seen so far. Is Russia not an imperialist power? Yes, it is. Yeah, it is. Uh, you can check out Politsturm. P-O-L-I-T-S-T-U-R-M. Did a video on is Russia is Russia imperialist recently? And uh, that's a good video. Also, Marxist Paul, another channel, did a video on is Russia imperialist. Between the two of them, you can watch them in 45 minutes. Yes, both are imperialist. Both make the case plainly, Russia is imperialist, yeah. And that quote was from Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. Basically, the Russian Federation has far more in common with and is a direct continuation of reactionary Russian nationalism. They recast the positive aspects of the USSR as a display of such nationalism, while casting its failures as the failures of communism. Yep. of discussion of various little snippets here in the chat. The big thesis I would typically consider to be the Ur-Trotskyite theory is that of the, quote, administrative pseudo-class. There is some stuff of worth produced, but they do tend to get bogged down in people's liberation front versus popular, versus front for popular liberation nonsense. Um, yeah. Uh, Russian defending Twitter is literally just doing it because there's a loud, self-sustaining echo chamber. Principal position is that of, well, I would go beyond saying of neutrality, it's revolutionary defeatism. Uh, but again, you know, is the, is the organizing going in that direction? It's got to go in that direction. You know, uh, this was the problem at the outbreak of the war, the invasion of Ukraine is i mean it's just like when the u.s invades places um is there an organized socialist left that is able to do the appropriate agitation and organizing off of it so you know but it i think that we're going to see and we were covering uh material about the 2008 crash and another looming crash which may encompass all asset classes not just mortgages not just the dot-com bubble, but literally everything in the capitalist economy. We may be approaching some really severe crashes that is going to leave world capitalism extraordinarily vulnerable. So after 2008, you know, people who are younger might not remember before 2008, almost no one was talking about capitalism at all. 2008 put it back on the map in a big way. Um, and you know, whatever the crash of 2023, 2024, we don't know yet, is going to do. I mean, we'll be glad that channels like this one and similar are already setting, have already set up and are running because we're going to have to um, keep building off of this 
in a hurry. You know, the right wing is going to put out more equivalents of the Tea Party, which is what they did in 2008, 2009, as, you know, this kind of pseudo-populist crap. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, war is a racket run on workers. Russia is invading at behest of their capitalist class. I mean, that's who runs the country. Ukraine has a Nazi problem Russia is not trying to solve. Watch Marxist Paul on campism. Just got to get the word out. Honest actors will accept critiques. Yes, and we have to organize. Absolutely. Rev Left Radio has an amazing interview with the Workers Front of Ukraine, Marxist Leninist, on the principled position in the Ukraine conflict. You know, and again, um, you know, having the principled position is great, but you also have to organize around it. And, uh, you know, you have to out organize places like the CPRF or KPRF, which we did uh, in the last stream and in the community tab, um, a story about Nina Ostanina of the KPRF doing LGBTQ bashing legislation, sucking up to Putin. These are extreme opportunists um, that aren't communists, dis despite what they call themselves. And there are smaller underground communist groups in Russia and Ukraine. This is, I think, where the organizing has to come from. Yeah, uh, some MLs do cite this idea of revolutionary defeatism to support Russia, but that's a fundamentally flawed application of it. Revolutionary defeatism doesn't mean that you support any bourgeoisie. It means the entire bourgeoisie of all countries loses. So trying to apply it selectively to just your country and no one else's, it doesn't make any sense. But this is, I think, just how much nationalism has infected um, the communist movement in general. There's a place for nationalism in countries emerging out of feudalism and things like that, but by and large, there's a lot of nationalism in places where it does not belong in a fundamentally internationalist movement. All right. So, yeah, um, actually replying to that comment also, there's another comment. Of those, quote, MLs, actually read Lenin's work, The Defeat of One's Own Government in the Imperialist War. We have it on the channel. They would see that they are not taking on Lenin's position. They are actually applying Trotsky's straw man of it that Lenin attacks in that very same work. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Shakespeare, I'm glad that uh, your role got processed. Thank you for doing that, and I'm taking care of Ace Man right now. That's good. For some reason it said that uh, you couldn't do that, so... All right, let us move on from that because we are caught up with the chat. And let's do a couple of COVID odds and ends. Um, so where did I want to start with this? So this is not going to be a long uh, thing about the medical particulars of COVID. But I saw a piece of news the other day. What did I say this is? COVID Powell. Here we go. Um, this is a food writer. Julie Powell, 49 years old, and you can see there, she's like a little bit overweight, but not, you know, extremely so. We know that being over overweight or obese is a risk factor for COVID. However, she's not hundreds and hundreds of pounds, you know, obese. She, like three quarters of the United States, is somewhat overweight. It's a very common condition in the U.S. But she's 49, and she died. And... So what's going on here? What did she die of? Julie Powell, this is off of CNN, a best-selling author who chronicled her efforts to prepare every recipe in Julia Child's Mastering the Art of French Cooking, which later inspired the movie. Julie and Julia died October 26 at her home in New York. She was 49. Her death was confirmed to the New York Times by her husband, Eric Powell, who said that the cause was cardiac arrest. Huh. So what was her COVID history? Well, these are in reverse chronological order, so the earlier ones are down at the bottom. So two months ago, September 7, oh no, my husband tested positive three days ago. This isn't hypochondria or weak immune system, it's COVID. September 10, decided to take a nap and woke up sick as a dog. This is how the COVID hits, I guess, all of a sudden like. Three days later, speaking of dogs, I fear my dog has COVID. 
Uh, and then same day, weirdly, my COVID is getting worse. Terrible headache, cough, probable fever, fatigue. Finally, September 20, uh, she seems to have recovered, but, uh, you know, says my husband has recently been down by COVID twice in a month, and that's with mask wearing and all available boosters. I would wonder exactly what kind of mask he was wearing, though, because if it's not an N95 or better, P100, something like that, FF2, um, KN95, something. Although my understanding is a lot of the KN95s being sold in the U.S. may be counterfeit, so I would stick to the N95s or the P100s myself. There's also N99. Anyway, um, yeah, so she's going to keep masking up. And then now, a month later, she has died of cardiac arrest. So when we talk about studies that say that people are more likely to die in the 12 months after getting COVID than any other 12-month period. So this, uh, the first thing that we covered about this was a population study out of Estonia where they took a big health database and they looked at you know hundreds of thousands of people. And basically those who had COVID in the previous 12 months were more likely to have died. And it was statistically significant and all that kind of stuff that you do in a study. Uh, they're more likely to die in those uh, 12 months following a COVID infection than people who weren't. We've covered stories about how after the pandemic started, the heart attack rate went up sixfold in India. So this is what you get. People in their 40s, 50s, early 60s, you know, they're nowhere near the end of their life expectancy. They're in otherwise average health. They get COVID and then they die not during the acute phase. They don't die of the pneumonia. They're not on the respirator or ventilator. Uh, but then they drop dead of a heart attack or a stroke or some other thing. Recently, Coolio died, the one and only Coolio. And he, again, he was in his 50s and people were talking about COVID there. I don't have all the details on that one. But this is what it looks like when I talk about COVID shaving a decade or two off your life. Even if you live, it ages your organs dramatically. So what happened here, um, she had COVID, dropped dead about a month and a half later at 49 of cardiac arrest. So, you know, um, this, is, this is exactly what we're talking about of needing to contain this spread. Now, speaking of, um, I mentioned recently how Rochelle Walensky, director of the CDC, was telling people um, to wash their hands, but didn't mention anything about masks. Then she got COVID about 10 days ago. So here's the headlines from two days ago. CDC Director Rochelle Walensky tests positive for COVID again after taking a course of the antiviral pill Paxlovid. So Paxlovid works great if you're over 60 or 65. If you're not, it doesn't do a lot for you. Walensky was born in 1969. She is not that old. So, you know, these people you uh, live by COVID minimization and denial and, you know, you reap what you sow in this case. So she's telling people, oh, wash your hands against respiratory uh, viruses. Literally, is she afraid of like bursting into flames if she mentions masks or something like that? No, this is the midterms. This is um, wanting to look, wanting things to look normal, et cetera, uh, for elections. So yeah, anyway, she has now had COVID on and off for 10 days. And, um, you know, she took the Paxlovid. It came back. She's 53 years old. This isn't good for you. It shaves years off your life. It ages your organs. It ages your brain because it directly infects the brain and so on and so forth. Anyway, um, you know, it's, I take no real pleasure in saying that she has COVID again. It's just the obvious outcome of this. Can we just get it so nobody has COVID, please? I mean, it's, this is an awful situation. So um, speaking of, do people in the U.S. support bringing back the mask mandates on transportation? Here's a YouGov poll, The Economist and YouGov. This is really recent, uh, October 16 to 18, 2022. Poll of 1,500 uh, adult citizens in the U.S. And uh, the question, 21B, would you support or oppose a policy that made it mandatory to wear masks in the following places? And uh, so you can see the breakdown of uh, overall 
Strong or somewhat support is 58%. Uh, somewhat opposed is 11%. So that's kind of lukewarm, um, you know, opposition to it. Strongly oppose is only as great a number as somewhat support. So again, the the opposition is smaller than the support. Not sure is six percent. How do you how are you not sure about that? I don't really understand that. We've covered this. This is I think the third time that we've covered attitudes towards masking. Um, you know, being broken down by gender, race, um, political party, ideology. As you can see, there's much more support. If you look lower right, ideology, liberal 54%, moderate 34%, 17% conservative, uh, s strongly support. So you can see the more conservative you are, the more you're opposed to it. Um, why? Because it's just an anti-science position that they've been taught and they run with it. And uh, I don't know, you know, but you're fighting for freedom to not wear a quote face diaper literally people are catching this thing you know for the third or fourth time i think actually in um julie powell's case she said she had not caught covid before as far as she knew so this was the first time that she caught it you know is it a coincidence that she died about six weeks later i would suggest probably it isn't but anyway um the tsa closing out this segment of covid odds and ends here's a story from forbes Supreme Court allows the TSA to issue mask mandates. So this came into question earlier in the year. Basically, there was like a Trump judge, I think in Florida, who made a ruling that, um, you know, basically the, the existing mask mandates could not be enforced. And so literally people were taking their masks off mid-flight on airplanes as this was announced and spreading whatever they were carrying at that particular time. And um, so now the TSA is allowed to do this. This is interesting because I think that originally the ruling was against the CDC having the authority to mandate masks. Uh, there's a bit more on the screen here. Anyway, I'm going to skip over the details right now. But basically, on Monday, the Supreme Court left in place a ruling that allows the TSA, Transportation Security Administration, to issue mask mandates on planes, trains, and other forms of transport, as it had done for more than a year during the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic. Can we get over the peak? This is Forbes writing here. Um, peak. Well, technically, the uh, I'm looking for it. Technically, Omicron was the peak of cases, but look at the situation that we've been in for the last seven, eight months. It's like the three previous surges, not counting Omicron, combined. So as far as, you know, we're out of the peak. No, we're not. There's more COVID happening right now than ever. And the variants that we're dealing with are more contagious and rapidly mutating. We're dealing with like five surging variants right now. It's a terrible situation. My thought on this is the Supreme Court is like, we're headed for a real shit show this winter. We don't want complete pandemonium going on uh so you know we need to get some kind of mask mandate reinstated we'll see what actually happens now before we switch back to the chat for a minute um before proceeding to our sort of main feature for today let's thank the patrons for supporting the stream i would um i would make content even if nobody supported but i wouldn't be able to spend this much time on it that's where the financial support comes in. So patreon.com slash socialism for all if you want to get your name on the screen, $2 a month or more, whatever you see fit. It's all very encouraging and it's very helpful. So appreciate the patrons a lot. Again, patreon.com slash socialism for all. And um, of course, engagement counts too, whether or not you're a patron, like, share, subscribe, and comment. That helps YouTube to recommend this channel to more people. So we do the live streams, we do audiobooks, we do everything that we can in the uh, time available to us. All right, let's head back to the chat for a minute before we pivot to today's major topic, which is spotting uh, infiltrators and uh, possible law enforcement within movements. Again, this isn't uh, gonna be conclusive, decisive stuff, but it's some things to look at and uh, we'll look at four different articles about this. Okay, if we have time, we'll look at as many as we can. All right, what do we have?
Thinking back, how often was Russia right there being a belligerent uh, alongside the U.S. in all these proxy wars around the world? I can't describe how much I feel that the uh, S4A channel is just an alternate universe. No one is having these kinds of conversations. It's refreshing and maddening at the same time. Yeah, um, you know, I, I hope that the uh, channel's reach spread spreads and we'll get some more of this going in the real world. Because uh, I agree, a lot of this stuff is just severely suppressed. The use of revolutionary defeatism to justify supporting some other national bourgeoisie because they're against our bourgeoisie is an absolutely bizarre sort of inversion of the OG social imperialism. Lenin would have been dumbfounded that this is what happened. True enough. I mean, I facepalm every time I see it. Like, And, you know, what can I say except for I guess we've reached the limit of the idiocy and the absurdity and we can only get better from here, hopefully. Quote, the phrase banding Trotsky has completely lost his bearings on a simple issue. It seems to him that to desire Russia's defeat means desiring the victory of Germany. Bukvoyed and Semkovsky give more direct expression to the thought, or rather want of thought, which they share with Trotsky. But Trotsky regards this as the, quote, methodology of social patriotism. To help people that are unable to think for themselves, the Berne Resolution made it clear that in all imperialist countries, the proletariat must now desire the defeat of its own government. So yeah, so basically he was saying, Trotsky was saying, well, we're in Russia, and if you're saying that we want Russia to lose, then we want Germany to win. No, it means that you have a socialist revolution. So anyway, it's just, you don't want the bourgeoisie coming out of the war with the same or more power than they had going in. This isn't that complicated of a concept. But, you know, you see all the opportunists and revisionists just twisting and twisting because it's their fucking job. That's, you know, what they're out to do. They're allied with the bourgeoisie. Uh, the CDC is not inept. It could do a lot more. They're, they're paid to be this way. Yeah, yeah. They're, um, it's meant to be shit so that people don't demand more public health funding leading the way for full privatization. It was said of Rochelle Walensky that she was a really good COVID warrior prior to getting in, and then she got her marching orders, and here we are. You know, she, she's now had COVID for 10 days because she has to, you know, lead this minimizer denialist lifestyle. I don't think it's going to serve her very well. Yeah, big emphasis on the racial and income differences in this poll, and that's been every single time when we've covered it. It's the richer you are, the whiter you are, the more conservative you are, the more you're going to oppose the masking. And uh, particularly black Americans support masking the most, are least likely to say that they feel that their children are safe in schools from COVID, things like that. So, yeah, there's major, um, you know, when you break it down, race, class, gender, there's a lot going on there. I am sad to note that Mexico removed their mask mandates. Now only very few people are wearing them. I knew people who would get angry when once in Mexican airspace they had to put masks on in the airport, they raged the entire time. You know, which is the bigger inconvenience to you, wearing a mask for however long you're in public or having 10 or 20 years shaved off your life? But I don't know that people are always, um, you know, fully up to date on all the information about the health risks of COVID. So going back to, you know, the CDC being inept or whatever, there's a mountain of evidence that long COVID is very real, that not just long COVID, but just organ damage incurred during the acute phase that can last for years and years is all this stuff is real. COVID has a lot of health risks that it poses outside of those first three weeks of the infection. Tons of long-term risks of COVID. Immune 
suppression because it infects your T-cells. People have been showing reduced T-cell counts who have had COVID. Um, all kinds of things, brain damage, heart damage, liver damage, kidney damage, you know, uh, gastrointestinal disruption, muscle pain, nerve pain, all kinds of stuff, you know, unable to smell, all food tastes like literal garbage, um, you know, disruptions to your senses, your olfactory sense. This is what's going on. The CDC could be talking about this every single day. Instead, we get mass score vax completely undermines any sense of a collective response. Oh yeah, so Lula won in Brazil. So yeah, it's true. Lula is a social democrat, not a communist or anything like that, and has participated in interventions in places like Haiti, which we're going to cover in a subsequent stream. I'm not sure if this week or next week, but we're going to do more on that subject. But you know, I tweeted out, it's, uh, I mean, Lula over Bolsonaro, it's better for Brazil, it's better for the world. Um, I think a person or two had a little bit of trouble understanding the word better. But yeah, he's a social democrat, um, and nobody should get complacent about that. But uh, yeah, apparently some of the Bolsonaro supporters are doing the Trump thing of like, refusing to concede and demonstrating and things like this. Is there some sort of fascist playbook that these people are referencing? Well, this happened, um, there's a documentary, and I'm sure that there might be better documentaries, but the one that I saw first was called The Revolution Will Not Be Televised, about um, how they tried to oust Hugo Chavez. This was like in the early 2000s. I think that the documentary is from like 2004. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the whole, like, the entire uh, private media apparatus was, um, you know, just attacking Chavez, like, incessantly. So, I mean, they use all the means at their disposal. Um, it doesn't matter what country it is. So you, we see this in the United States now with uh, the Trump you know, Republicans. Um, you know, and so, sometimes Democrats try to, like, really parse out, like, the... Um, you know, the white nationalist MAGA Republicans from the rest of the Republicans, they're all basically on the same page. I mean, I think somebody made the point that like Liz Cheney, supposedly of, supposedly the leader of the quote resistance against Trump, like voted uh, with the rest of the Trump people like over 90 percent of the time. Like this is uh, they don't like Trump's style. They think it's too unstable, but the policies are not really that different. Anyway, is there a fascist playbook? Yeah, there's a far right convergence happening globally right now and all of these parties uh whether it's georgia maloney whether it's afd like around the world the far right is definitely coalescing victor orban they sh are sharing information and they're sharing strategy so basically at this point we have a fascist international growing and we don't have a common turn and i think that we need one and uh we need one now. <laughs> what can I say? There are various uh, coalitions of communist groups around the world. It needs to grow, and I think it needs to get a lot better, and it needs to be pretty strict about revisionism because that has been a major problem in the international communist movement for a long time now, decades now. So, yeah, we've got a fascist international, and I don't think it's as uh, comparable on the communist side, and it, it needs to become that, and I hope to see that in the next few years. Yeah, turn imperialist war into class war, exactly. I remember people got furious because Bestie Mark said that people are more concerned about geopolitics than class struggle. Yeah, that uh, is often a telling factor. Do, do, do the people doing the analysis mention class, or is it just this sort of lazy campist national struggle instead of class struggle? There is a certain point where you could say that national struggle in some ways, like if it was a country that was run by the proletariat, could have a class struggle aspect to it. But that is um, not the case, you know, when capitalist countries are fighting with each other. Uh, strangely enough, I, I've become lactose intolerant in the last two years. Didn't think it could possibly be related to COVID. So the gut can be a reservoir of COVID. COVID can hang out in your body for months and months afterwards. The gut is a common place that it hangs out. It is possible uh, that it is connected. I mean, the symptoms that people have reported from long COVID, the most common ones are brain fog, fatigue, 
and muscle pain, but there are many others. And yeah, it's it's possibly related, sure. I grew up around a lot of right-wing family members who would always just say any election that the right didn't win was stolen. This is just part of their worldview that the political establishment has just embraced out of desperation. The instability it raises in their social order be damned. Yeah, everything's a conspiracy. Nothing's their fault. Um, I mean, this is the aggressive, you know, self-centeredness, uh, the, the narcissism of it, where they're always right. Everyone else is always wrong. Facts be damned. Just you apply as much force as is necessary to achieve the results that you want. There's no real regard for truth or whatever. Um, yeah, it gets it gets old really fast. I'm shocked that Biden congratulated Lula rather than backing a coup. Brazil is very important geopolitically, even if Lula isn't exactly radical. Well, we'll see what happens, you know, as far as Lula's actual rule. I think it's, uh, you know, between the Democrats and the Republicans, it is legitimately hard to say at this point that one is better than the other. They are somewhat different, but as far as better or worse, it's difficult to say in many cases. Um, in this case, we'll see, you know, what, but then again, um, you know, this was when Bolsonaro won, it was one of the first major elections that the right had won in a while. And it was really only because, uh, or arguably only because Lula was thrown in jail on trumped up charges. So, you know, it was a bit of a deviation for Bolsonaro to win in the first place. Um, the conservative victim complex is truly astonishing. They want to be the victim, even when they're clearly being the oppressors. Well, you know, again, see Russia right now. Um, it's the kind of hypocrisy you must engage in when you are trying to rule over people, you know, in an oppressive way, as the capitalists do. They're an exploitative minority. How do they appeal to the vast majority of people? They have to lie. You know, they have to be deceptive. Bestie Marx was correct, as mentioned in a previous stream. These people who claim imperialism is at all times the internal struggle within each country is dead wrong, and Mao explains this clearly. It's the job of communists in colonized countries to tie the national liberation struggle directly to the class struggle. Otherwise, the bourgeoisie will stop halfway and become compradors. Once national liberation succeeds, the new principal contradiction is between the proletariat and bourgeoisie. Absolutely correct. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this is like where people, um, I saw a lot of this back in March, trying to explain why support for Russia's invasion was wrong. And people were like, what about China? The CPC allied with the Kuomintang, the nationalists, um, to fight against Japanese imperialism. Yeah, and they also fought them on and off. And uh, the whole idea was to keep the communists in the lead of that. So yeah, just like letting nationalism run amok and being like, imperialism is the primary contradiction, this is just completely wrong. All right, so we are caught up. Let us, um, let us go ahead and get into our feature presentation. All right, no, I'm definitely overselling it, but a few articles about informants in parties and things to look out for. And again, I'm really not trying to sow paranoia. So let me off the bat just state that that is not the purpose of this. It's more for people who are already struggling with some issues within an org that they may be having problems with. And, you know, maybe this will confirm what you were already thinking. It's a real thing that people need to protect themselves from. But that said, there's not an informant behind like every bush. Um, so, you know, again, the purpose is not to sow paranoia, but cops are real. <laughs> Infiltration is real. Monitoring is real. And you should be, you know, keep an eye out for it. Don't like sleep with both eyes open every night. But I mean, keep an eye out. So here's a short article just to um, give a demonstration of cop behavior. Uh, this is from Law Enforcement on LEO Weekly. Uh, Feds, ex-Louisville police officer, used law enforcement tech to help hack sexually explicit photos from women. 
by Josh Wood. This is from October 12th. You're going to see how this ties into the next story that we're going to cover. So if it doesn't, if it isn't clear immediately, uh, bear with. A former Louisville Metro Police Department officer used law enforcement technology as part of a scheme that involved hacking the Snapchat accounts of young women and using sexually explicit photos and videos that they had taken to extort them, federal prosecutors said in court documents filed on Tuesday. According to a sentencing memorandum, Brian Wilson used his law enforcement access to Accurant, a powerful data combing software used by police departments to assist in investigations to obtain information about potential victims. He would then share that information with a hacker who would hack into private Snapchat accounts to obtain sexually explicit photos and videos. If sexually explicit material was obtained, Wilson would then contact the women, threatening to post the photos and videos online and share them with their friends, family, employer, and coworkers unless more explicit, or excuse me, unless more sexually explicit material was provided to him. So he's basically exploiting them for, you know, ogling them and, and having like them send more pictures and videos uh, of them, uh, you know, in a sexual way. In June, the DOJ announced that Wilson, 36 at the time, had pleaded guilty to a cyber stalking charge, as well as to a charge related to what LMPD has called slushy gate. Here we go. A series of incidents in which Wilson and other officers assaulted pedestrians by throwing beverages out of unmarked patrol vehicles and sometimes filming their exploits. So when people say a cab, all cops are bastards. This is there. It's an unaccountable network of gangs across the United States. The police are completely out of control in the United States. It's stuff like this. And you don't need any higher education to be a cop at all. You would think that maybe, you know, considering that to be a nurse, you need like at least two years of college in most places. There would be some, you know, these people carry guns. They are given the power of life and death. You would think there would at a minimum be some sort of uh, criteria for people um, to not be the absolute worst. Not that going to two years of college automatically um, makes you a person of like extreme upright moral character. But there are literally just no fucking standards whatsoever. And so you often just get the lowest of the low going into these jobs just explicitly. I mean, it's been alleged that they even just filter for people with a psychopathic, you know, bully uh, personality. Anyway, According to prosecutors, the FBI determined that Wilson was involved in the hacking of 25 accounts and made contact with eight women. While Wilson said another person did the hacking, no hacker is named in federal court documents seen by Elio Weekly. Quote, I'm curious which picture you'd prefer me to use as the focal point of a collage I'm making. Wilson texted one victim alongside photos of her he'd obtained, according to court records. So basic, you know, fascist mentality, um... You know, this kind of basically, you know, this guy is just working his, his way up to an eventual rape someday. You cool with me posting him? He followed up. I'm telling you, everyone will love them. When the victim asked how he got the photos, Wilson said, quote, I had planned to send your pictures to your parents, brother, grandparents, sisters, friends, Facebook, Pornhub, employer, etc. But I would gladly keep all of this between you and I. Of course, we know it's you and me should be, and tell you who sent them to me if you promise to leave me out of the drama and show me a few more pics. That way we both can benefit. What a fucking scumbag. So um, anyway, he posted the photos and videos anyway and bragged about it and uh, eventually got caught. Federal prosecutors that wrote that during text exchanges attempting to extort women, Wilson called the victims sluts, whores, and bitches. This, combined with the extortion and the publishing of sexually explicit material online, quote, caused his victims untold psychological trauma. Uh, in one case, the victim had sexually explicit photos and vic victim, uh, videos sent to their employer, which prosecutors said almost resulted in her termination. And prosecutors recommend that Wilson receive a sentence at the lowest end of the applicable sentencing guidelines as a result of his guilty plea to both the slushy gate charge and the cyber stalking charge. He faced a maximum of 15 years in prison. Uh, and then there's another guy who's in slushy gate, faces a maximum of 10 years. Oh, they're scheduled to be sentenced on October 19, and I didn't see that. So, and then separately, there's another LMPD 
officer arrested on a revenge porn charge after allegedly sending a sexually explicit photo of a woman to 19 people in a group text message. So there's another podcast that got started recently, Thin Blue Lies, hosted by Comrade Sal of the Red Army, Chair Lady Spears on Twitter. And uh, the entire podcast, it's a true crime podcast. The twist is it's all crimes committed by cops. So I'm going to have to look up what the sentences actually wound up being because I got this article a few weeks ago. and um, The sentencing should be out by now, so we'll have to follow up with that. But this is the kind of, you know, this is not uncommon whatsoever. So this leads us into an article from Insight. This is from 2010. It's a little old, but these, the principles of these things don't really change. Why Misogynists Make Great Informants, How Gender Violence on the Left Enables State Violence and Radical Movements. So for all the people who um, think that you're a communist just because you understand what a commodity is or something and have yet to sort of branch out into all of the ways that capitalism and as well as previous stages of class society have reshaped human society away from the way that we were before for thousands of years, arguably our natural state, uh, which was not patriarchal, etc. Um, buckle up and don't comment too much because you really have a lot to learn. If you're basically, you know, you were a conservative six months ago, you learned what a commodity is, now you're a quote communist. No, there's a lot of understanding that still needs to happen as far as, you know, how racism, how sexism, how heterosexism, you know, patriarchy generally, how all of this factors in and helps to uphold capitalism. So I'm just appreciating right now up front, hold your comments because you don't know shit. Anyway, some people may have seen this article already, which has been making its rounds on Facebook and the blogosphere, but Insight blog editors loved it so much that we wanted to share it here. This piece was originally published in Makeshift Magazine's Spring-Summer 2010 issue and written by Courtney Desiree Morris. In January 2009, activists in Austin, Texas, learned that one of their own, a white activist named Brandon Darby, had infiltrated groups protesting the Republican National Convention as an FBI informant. Darby later admitted to wearing recording devices at planning meetings and during the convention. He testified on behalf of the government in the February 2009 trial of two Texas activists who were arrested at the RNC on charges of making and possessing Molotov cocktails after Darby encouraged them to do so. The two young men, David McKay and Bradley Crowder, each faced up to 15 years in prison. Crowder accepted a plea bargain to serve three years in a federal prison. Under pressure from federal prosecutors, McKay also pled guilty to being in possession of, quote, unregistered Molotov cocktails. I didn't know you had to register. I didn't know you could register those, anyway. And was sentenced to four years in prison. Information gathered by Darby may also have contributed to the case against the RNC-8, activists from around the country charged with, quote, conspiracy to riot and conspiracy to damage property in the furtherance of terrorism. Unquote. Austin activists were particularly stunned by the revelation that Darby had served as an informant because he had been a part of various leftist projects and was a leader at Common Ground Relief, a New Orleans-based organization committed to meeting the short-term needs of community members displaced by natural disasters in the Gulf Coast region and dedicated to rebuilding the region and ensuring Katrina evacuees' right to return. This was, of course, Hurricane Katrina. I was surprised but not shocked by this news. I had learned as an undergrad at the University of Texas that the campus police department routinely placed plainclothed police officers in the meetings of radical student groups, you know, just to keep an eye on them. That was in fall of 2001. We saw the creation of the Department of Homeland Security, watched a cowboy president wage war on terror, and in the middle of it all, tried to figure out what we could do to challenge the fascist state transformations taking place before our eyes. At the time, however, it seemed silly that there were cops in our meetings. We weren't the Panthers or the Brown Berets or even some of the rowdier direct action anti-globalization activists on campus, though we did admire them. We were just young people who didn't believe that war was the best response to the 9-11 attacks. But it wasn't silly. The FBI does not dismiss political work. Any organization, be it large or small, can provoke the scrutiny of the state. Perhaps your organization poses a large threat, or maybe you're small now, but one day you'll grow up and be too big to rein in. The state usually opts to kill the movement before it grows. 
and informants and provocateurs are the state's hired gunmen. Government agencies pick people that no one will notice. Often, it's impossible to prove that they're informants because they appear to be completely dedicated to social justice. They establish intimate relations with activists, becoming friends and lovers, often serving in leadership roles in organizations. A cursory reading of the literature on social movements and organizations in the 1960s and 1970s, New Left period, reveals this fact. The leadership of the American Indian movement was rife with informants. It is suspected that informants were also largely responsible for the downfall of the Black Panther Party, and the same can be surmised about the anti-war movement of the 1960s and 70s. Not surprisingly, these movements that were toppled by informants and provocateurs were also sites where women and queer activists often experienced intense gender violence, as the autobiographies of activists such as Asada Shakur, Elaine Brown, and Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz demonstrate. Uh, I'll just add there, I have known um, more unsung female comrades who have reported things like, yeah, like circa 1970, being told by the men in their organizations that it was their revolutionary duty to have sex with them and so on. So this was the kind of treatment um, that we saw. And I wonder if anybody's going to point out, possibly in the chat, the um, Stokely Carmichael uh, quote on the subject. Maybe it isn't that informants are difficult to spot, but rather that we have collectively ignored the signs that give them away. Here's an interesting thought, and let's reread that. Maybe it isn't that informants are difficult to spot, but rather that we have collectively ignored those signs which give them away. To save our movements, we need to come to terms with the connections between gender violence, male privilege, and the strategies that informants and people who act just like informants use to destabilize radical movements. Time and again, heterosexual men in radical movements have been allowed to assert their privilege and subordinate others. Despite all that we say to the contrary, the fact is that radical social movements and organizations in the U.S. have refused to seriously address gender violence as a threat to the survival of our struggles. We've treated misogyny, homophobia, and heterosexism as lesser evils, secondary issues that will eventually take care of themselves or fade into the background once the, quote, real issues, racism, the police, class inequality, U.S. wars of aggression, are resolved. There are serious consequences for choosing ignorance. Misogyny and homophobia are central to the reproduction of violence in radical activist communities. Let me add here, people often say, hey, S4A, what party should I join? The only things I steer people towards by name are either, either the big tent stuff, like the Greens or DSA, which is for a number of reasons, which I've explained over and over again. Being in the wrong organization can be literally life shattering. I have talked to and had this experience myself, uh, being in a bad organization and it just turns you off to doing any real world work for years. Um, potentially also creating, you know, if there's a sexual assault involved um, or you know, something on that level, uh, you know, <laughs> trauma that extends beyond the realm of just political activism. But yeah, this is not as uncommon as we would like it to be. And it's, you know, arguably because in part on the one level, we're trying to organize within a society where these things are viewed as fairly normal. Second, also, these things are used by uh, police, informants, provocateurs, infiltrators as ways of purposely disrupting our organizations. So when I steer people towards big tent organizations, there's a number of reasons for this. I have explained them before. One of them is reliably you can get into these uh, big tent organizations in just about every area of the country. There's some presence. and. You know, I don't want to be the one responsible for referring you to some specific group. First of all, I don't think we have the party that we need at this point that is really rolling along. I've discussed this in recent streams uh, that, you know, has deep ties to the masses, is ideologically correct consistently, on and on. I don't think that we have that party right now. Um, but if we do, it's up to you to find it, not me. And I, the last thing I want is to refer people to some small organization, have them have, have some horrendous experience, and uh, you know that that was for me. So I would rather you go out, network with your local left, meet people, find out what else they're involved with, because pretty much anybody 
in these parties is going to be involved with some other community projects of some kind. And you go find out. But you, you got to talk to people in your area. I can't, you know, I don't have an ear to the ground in literally every area of all 50 states, etc. cetera. And, uh, but this, this is part of the reason why, because sometimes really bad stuff goes on. And I'm not going to vouch for any of it because right now I, I just don't think that uh, the movement's in that kind of shape. That said, we do need to rebuild it. So I want you to go out there, find your left, network with people, see who you trust, see who you think is doing good projects. And again, I give you some big tent recommendations to steer you towards so that you can go find your left, figure that out. You can find the underground from there. Uh, but that's something that you're, you're going to have to figure out. And uh, that's just the way it is. Anyway, where were we? Um, scratch a little deeper and you might find the markings. Oh, sorry. Backing up. Um, there are serious consequences for choosing ignorance. Misogyny and homophobia are central to the reproduction of violence in radical activist communities. Scratch a misogynist and you'll find a homophobe. Scratch a little deeper, and you might find the makings of a future informant or someone who just destabilizes movements in the same way that informants do. So in other words, the uh, isn't on the payroll, but might as well be for the effect that they're having on the other activists. So case study, the makings of an informant, Brandon Darby and Common Ground. On Democracy Now!, Malik Rahim, former Black Panther and co-founder of Common Ground in New Orleans, spoke about how devastated he was by Darby's revelation that he was an FBI informant. Several times he stated that his heart had been broken. He especially lamented all of the young ladies who left Common Ground as a result of Darby's domineering, aggressive style of organizing. And when those young ladies complained, well, their concerns likely fell on sympathetic but ulti ultimately unresponsive ears. Everything may have been true, and after the fact everyone admits how disrupt Dar how disruptive Darby was, quick to suggest violent, ill-conceived direct action schemes that endangered everyone he worked with. There were even claims of Darby sexually assaulting female organizers at Common Ground, and in general being dismissive of women working in the organization. Darby created, by the way, every time that you post a comment online that, um, you know, I quote, identity politics, meaning literally any discussion of racism, sexism, etc., is uh, just like lib shit or a distraction from communism, you're contributing to this every time that you make comments like that. The problem in liberal idpol is the liberalism, not the idpol. So you can't seriously study capitalism, especially in a place like the United States, and not come to the conclusion that it's deeply intertwined with racism, with sexism, with heterosexism, because you know the sexism and heterosexism are stem from patriarchy, that you, you can't deny that these things are intertwined with the way that capitalism is upheld. So to say that there's you know, no discussion of any identity other than class, like race and gender or sexual orientation, just have nothing to do with anything, you're, you're just you're behaving in this same way. And for people in those statuses reading comments like that, you're just pushing them away. We don't allow comments like that here at the channel for that exact reason. Um, anyway, continuing. Darby created conflict in all of the organizations he worked with, yet people were hesitant to hold him accountable because of his history and reputation as an organizer and his, quote, dedication to, quote, the work. People continued to defend him until he outed himself as an FBI informant. Even Rahim, for all of his guilt and angst, chose to leave Darby in charge of Common Ground, although every time there was conflict in the organization, it seemed to involve this guy, Darby. Maybe if organizers made collective accountability around gender violence a central part of our practices, we could neutralize people who are working on behalf of the state to undermine our struggles. I'm not talking about witch hunts. I'm talking about organizing in such a way that we nip a potential Brandon Darby in the bud before he can hurt more people. Informants are hard to spot, but my guess is that where there's smoke, there's fire. And someone who creates chaos wherever they go is either an informant or an irresponsible, unaccountable time bomb who can be unintentionally as effective at undermining social justice organizing as an actual informant. Ultimately, they both do the work of the state, and they need to be held accountable. A brief historical reflection on gender violence in radical movements. 
Reflecting on the radical organizations and social movements of the 1960s and 1970s provides an important historical context for this discussion. Memoirs by women who are actively involved in these struggles reveal the pervasiveness of tolerance, and in some cases advocacy, of gender violence. Angela Davis, Asada Shakur, and Elaine Brown, each at different points in their experiences organizing with the Black Panther Party, cited sexism and the exploitation of women and their organizing labor in the BPP as one of their primary reasons for either leaving the group in the cases of Brown and Shakur or refusing to ever formally join in Davis's case. Although women were often expected to make significant personal sacrifices to support the movement, when women found themselves victimized by male comrades, there was no support for them or channels to seek redress. Whether it was BPP organizers ignoring the fact that Eldridge, Be Eldridge Cleaver beat his wife, noted activist Kathleen Cleaver, men coercing women into sex, or just men treating women organizers as subordinated sexual playthings, the BPP and similar organizations tended not to take seriously the corrosive effects of gender violence on liberation struggle. In many ways, Elaine Brown's autobiography, A Taste of Power, A Black Woman's Story, has gone the furthest in laying bare the ugly realities of misogyny in the movement and the various ways in which both men and women reproduced and reinforced male privilege and gender violence in these organizations. So just to pause there for a second, uh, it's obviously men who, uh, benefit the most directly from male privilege in as far as being able to act irresponsibly uh, without consequences. But women also help to uphold that and will stand up for the men when they're behaving in this way. What do the women get out of it? And you see this also in uh, white women upholding white supremacy as well. Well, they get this kind of, um, it's not equal to the men, but be this sort of being put on a pedestal status which is, it's a double-edged sword because on the one hand, um, particularly in the case of the white women upholding white supremacy, it's they get to be these sort of um, delicate flowers that this brutal system needs to protect. And so they get a certain sort of, um, not equality, but uh, flattery, I guess you could say, out of it, which has some real material um, effects to it. But, uh, yeah, so anyway, it's not just men upholding the system, it's, it's women as well. Continuing, her experience as the only woman to ever lead the BPP did not exempt her from the brutal misogyny of the organization. She recounts being assaulted by various male comrades, inc inc uh, including Huey Newton, as well as being beaten and terrorized by Aldridge Cleaver, who threatened to, quote, bury her in Algeria during a delegation to China. Her biography demonstrates more explicitly than either Davis's or Shakur's how the masculinist posturing of the BPP, and by extension many radical organizations at the time, created a culture of violence and misogyny that ultimately proved to be the organization's undoing. So comment, like I said before, we are attempting to organize in a society uh, which treats these things as normal. That's where the men learned these things from. At the same time, why are we organizing? We're organizing to change the society in which those things were learned and you know, were taught as normal. And that's both overt and um, indirect you know, as well. You can pick that up in many different ways. Uh, you don't often drive around and you know, see signs at the side of the road that say, beat your wife, treat women violently. It's usually more subtle than that. Sometimes, I guess it can be that overt. But we pick it up in a million different ways. It's communicated in a million different ways as sort of, you know, the way of the world, which of course is how much ruling class ideology is presented. Oh, that's just the way things are. No, that's the way this particular phase of class society works because it helps the people, the class that is ruling this particular phase of class society. But anyway, when we organize within that society, obviously we're gonna be stamped by some of the characteristics of that society. We also have to hold ourselves to a higher standard because we can't effectively change that society if we don't become conscious of these things and work to eradicate them within our organizations as we attempt to create a new world that does not have these things. Understanding that uh, it's difficult to stamp out overnight is not the same thing as apologizing for it. It still needs to be confronted wherever it's found. Anyway, continuing, these narratives demystify the legacy of gender violence of the very organizations that many of us look up to. They demonstrate how misogyny was normalized in these spaces, 
dismissed, and they're talking about within the organization now, dismissed as, quote, personal or not as important as the more, quote, serious struggles or against racism or class inequality. Gender violence has historically been deeply entrenched in the political practices of the left and constituted one of the greatest, if largely unacknowledged, threats to the survival of these organizations. However, if we pay attention to the work of Davis, Shakur, Brown, and others, we can avoid the mistakes of the past and create different kinds of political community. The Racial Politics of Gender Violence Race further complicates the ways in which gender violence unfolds in our communities. So pause. So this is intersectionality. It's to say that gender violence may be pervasive, but it's going to manifest differently in different racially segregated communities. And if you want to actually address it effectively, you have to understand those specific circumstances that are going on in these different communities. You know, people like different groups in society have their own specific subculture. And if you can't, you know, address that specifically, what you say, what you say, what you do, how you address it, it's just not going to land anyway. In Looking for Common Ground, Relief Work in Post-Katrina New Orleans as an American Parable of Race and Gender Violence, Rachel Luft explores the disturbing pattern of sexual assault against white female volunteers by white male volunteers doing rebuilding work in the Upper Ninth Ward in 2006. She points out how Common Ground failed to address white men's assaults on their co-organizers and instead shifted blame to the surrounding black community warning white women activists that they needed to be careful because New Orleans was a dangerous place. Ultimately, it proved easier to criminalize black men from the neighborhood than to acknowledge that white women and transgender organizers were most likely to be assaulted by white men that they worked with, not black men from the surrounding community. In one case, a white male volunteer was turned over to the police only after he sexually assaulted at least three women in one week. The privilege that white men enjoyed in Common Ground, an organization ostensibly committed to racial justice, meant that they could be violent toward women and queer activists, enact destructive behaviors that undermine the organization's work, and know that the movement would not hold them accountable in the same way that it did black men in the community where they worked. Of course, male privilege is not uniform. White men and men of color are unequal participants in and beneficiaries of patriarchy although they both can and do reproduce gender violence. This disparity in the distribution of patriarchy's benefits is not lost on women and queer organizers when we attempt to confront men of color who enact gender violence in our communities. We often worry about reproducing particular kinds of racist violence that disproportionately target men of color. We are understandably loath to call the police, involve the state in any way, or place men of color at the mercy of a historically racist criminal injustice system. Yet our communities, political and otherwise, often do not step up to demand justice on our behalf. We don't feel comfortable talking to therapists who just reaffirm stereotypes about how fucked up and exceptionally violent our home communities are. The left often offers even less support. Our victimization is unfortunate, problematic, but ultimately less important to, quote, the work than the men of all races who reproduce gender violence in our communities. Encountering misogyny on the left, a personal reflection. In the first community group I was actively involved in, I encountered a level of misogyny that I would never have imagined exist, existed in what was supposed to be a radical people of color organization. I was sexually and romantic. Can, can I just say, uh, I said this many times about the whole Patsock thing. And it's opportunism generally, it's right-wing bullshit generally in the, quote, communist movement. This was exactly uh, my reaction upon doing this channel, getting more involved in, you know, providing resources to the Marxist movement, which in part I thought was going to be better. And my surprise was profound. So, yeah, in the first community group I was actively involved in, I encountered a level of misogyny that I never would have imagined existed in what was supposed to be a radical people of color organization. I was sexually and romantically involved with an older Chicano activist in the group. I was 19, an inexperienced young black activist. He was 30. He asked me to keep our relationship a secret, and I reluctantly agreed. Later, after he ended the relationship and I was reeling from depression, I discovered that he had been sleeping with at least two other women while we were together. One of them was a friend of mine, 
another young woman we organized with. Unaware of the nature of our relationship, which he had failed to disclose with, to her, she slept with him until he disappeared, refusing to answer her calls or explain the abrupt end of their relationship. We would call that ghosting today. She and I, after sharing our experiences, began to trade stories with other women who knew and had organized with this man. We heard of the women who had left a Chicana student group and never came back after his lies and secrets blew up while the group was participating in a Zapatista action in Mexico City, the queer, radical, white organizer who left Austin to get away from his abuse. Another white woman, a social worker who thought that they might get married, only to come to his apartment one evening and find me there. And then there were the ones that came after me. I always wondered if they knew who he really was. The women he dated were amazing, beautiful, kick-ass, radical women that he used as shields to get himself into places he knew would never be open to such a misogynist. I mean, if that cool woman who worked in Chiapas, spoke Spanish, and worked with undocumented immigrants was dating him, he must be down, right? Wrong. But his misogyny didn't end there. It was also reflected in his style of organizing. In meetings, he always spoke the loudest and longest, using academic jargon that made any discussion any discussion excruciatingly more complex than necessary. The academic speak intimidated people less educated than he because he seemed to know more about radical politics than anyone else. He would talk down to other men in the group, especially those he perceived to be less intelligent than him, which was basically everybody. Then he'd switch gears, apologize for dominating the space, and acknowledge his need to check his male privilege. Ironically, when people did attempt to call him out on his shit, he would feign ignorance. What could they mean? saying that his behavior was masculinist and sexist. He'd complain of being infantilized, refusing to see how he infantilized people all the time. The fact that he was a man of color who could talk a good game about racism and racial justice struggles masked his abusive behaviors in both radical organizations and his personal relationships. As one of his former partners shared with me, quote, his radical race, anal <coughs> excuse me. His radical race analysis allowed people mostly men, but occasionally women as well, to forgive him for being dominating and abusive in his relationships. Women had to check their critique of his behavior at the door, lest we lose a man of color in the movement, unquote. One of the reasons it is so difficult to hold men of color accountable for reproducing gender violence is that women of color and white activists continue to be invested in the idea that men of color had it harder than anyone else. How do you hold someone accountable when you believe that he is target number one for the state? I see conversations like this going on all the time, and you just wonder when people are going to get it. Unfortunately, he wasn't the only man like this I encountered in radical spaces, just one of the smarter ones. Reviewing old emails, I'm shocked at the number of emails from men I organized with that were abusive in tone and content, how easily they would talk down to others for minor mistakes. I'm more surprised at my meek, at my meek diplomatic responses like an abuse survivor, as I attempted to placate companeros who saw nothing wrong with yelling at their partners, friends, and other organizers. There were men like this in various organizations I worked with. The one who called his girlfriend a bitch in front of a group of youth of color during a summer encuentro we were hosting. The one who sexually harassed a queer Chicana couple during a trip to Mexico, trying to pressure them into a threesome. The guys who said that they would complete a task, didn't do it, brushed off their companiera's demands for accountability, let those women take over the task, and when it was finished, took all the credit for someone else's hard work. The graduate student who hit his partner, and everyone knew he'd done it, but whenever anyone asked, people would just look ashamed and embarrassed and mumble, it's complicated. The ones who constantly demeaned queer folks, even people they organized with, especially the one who thought it would be a revolutionary act to, quote, well, Anyway, I'm not going to read all of that, uh, but you can read it there on the screen. The one who would shout you down in a meeting or tell you that, he, that you couldn't be a feminist because you were too pretty. My God. Or the one who thought that homosexuality was a disease from Europe. Yeah, that guy. Uh, is any of this ringing bells with recent conversations we've had, by the way? Yeah, I, I hope it is because uh, it's ringing bells for me. Most of these guys probably weren't informants, which is a pity because it means they were not getting paid a dime for all the destructive work they do. We might think of these misogynists as inadvertent agents of the state, 
regardless of whether they are actually informants or not, the work that they do supports the state's ongoing campaign of terror against social movements and the people who create them. When queer organizers are humiliated and their political struggles sidelined, that is part of an ongoing state project of violence against radicals. When women are knowingly given sexually transmitted infections, physically abused, dismissed in meetings, pushed aside, and forced out of radical organizing spaces while our allies defend known misogynists, organizers collude in the state's efforts to destroy us. The state has already understood a fact that the left has struggled to accept. Misogynists make great informants. Before or regardless of whether they are ever recruited by the state to disrupt a movement or destabilize an organization, they've likely become well-versed in practices of disruptive behavior. They require almost no training and can start the work immediately. What's more paralyzing to our work that's a question. What's more paralyzing to our work than when women and or queer folks leave our movements because they have been repeatedly lied to, humiliated, physically or verbally, emotionally or sexually abused? Or when you have to postpone conversations about the work so that you can devote group meetings to addressing an individual member's most recent offense? Or when that person spreads misinformation, creating confusion and friction among radical groups? Nothing slows down movement building like a misogynist. What the FBI gets is that when there are people in activist spaces who are committing to taking power and who understand power as domination, our movements will never realize their potential to remake this world. If our energies are absorbed recuperating from the messes that informants and people who act just like them create, we will never be able to focus on the real work of getting free and building the kinds of life-affirming, people-centered communities that we want to live in. To paraphrase Bell Hooks, where there's a will to dominate, there can be no justice, because we will inevitably continue reproducing the same kinds of injustice we claim to be struggling against. It is time for our movements to undergo a radical change from the inside out. Looking forward, creating gender justice in our movements. Radical movements cannot afford the destruction that gender violence creates. If we underestimate the political implications of patriarchal behaviors in our communities, the work will not survive. Now, let's just pause for a minute. Has the work survived? How many organizations have you seen come and go? And in how many of them was this a factor? In your organization, whatever you're in right now, and you might be in more than one, are men and women there in equal numbers? How are people who are non-binary treated as well? These are questions that people need to start taking a look at Again, if you want your organization to last and be productive, etc. Continuing. Lately, I've been turning to the work of queers and feminists of color to think through how to challenge these behaviors in our movements. I've been reading the autobiographies of women who lived through the chaos of social movements debilitated by machismo. I'm revisiting the work of Bell Hooks, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, Tony Cade Bambara, Alice Walker, Audre Lorde, Gioconda Belli. Margaret Randall, Elaine Brown, Pearl Kledge, uh, Nitozake Shange, and Gloria Anzaldua to see how other women negotiated gender violence in these spaces and to, pro and to problematize neat or easy answers about how violence is reproduced in our communities. Newer work by radical feminists of color has also been incredibly helpful, especially the zine revolution, oh, especially the zine, Revolution Starts at Home, Confronting Partner Abuse in Activist Communities, edited by ching and Chen, Dulani, and Leah Lakshmi, Plepsina Samar, Samarish... Sorry, I'm looking at really small text. Pipsina Samarasina. There we go. All right. But there are many resources for confronting this dilemma beyond books. The simple act of speaking and sharing our truths is one of the most powerful tools we have. I've been speaking to my elders, older women of color in struggle who have experienced the things I'm struggling against and swapping survival stories with other women. In summer 2008, I began doing workshops on ending misogyny and building collective forms of accountability with Christina Tsin, uh, Tsin Tsun, an Austin-based labor organizer and author of the essay, Killing Misogyny, A Personal Story of Love, violence and strategies for survival. We have also begun the even more liberating practice of naming our experiences publicly and calling on our communities to address what we 
and so many others have experienced. Dismantling misogyny cannot be work that only women do. We must all do the work because the survival of our movements depends on it. Until we make radical feminist and queer political ethics that directly challenge heteropatriarchal forms of organizing central to our political practice, radical movements will continue to be devastated by the antics of Brandon Darby's and folks who aren't informants but just act like them. A queer, radical, feminist ethic of accountability would challenge us to recognize how gender violence is reproduced in our communities, relationships, and organizing practices. Although there are many ways to do this, I want to suggest that there are three key steps that we can take to begin. First, we must support women and queer people in our movements who have experienced interpersonal violence and engage in a collective process of healing. Second, we must initiate a collective dialogue about how we want our communities to look and how to make them safe for everyone. Third, we must develop a model for collective accountability that truly treats the personal as political and helps us to begin practicing justice in our communities. When we allow women and queer organizers to leave activist spaces and protect people whose violence provoked their departure, we are saying that we value these de facto state agents who disrupt the work more than we value people whose labor builds and sustains movements. So I think that those three, uh, you know, the three key steps to begin with, you can apply. That's, that's, you know, nothing should be too controversial about that. As angry as gender violence on the left makes me, I am hopeful. I believe that we have the capacity to change and create more justice in our movements. We don't have to start witch hunts to reveal misogynists and informants. They out themselves every time. They refuse to apologize They take to take ownership of their actions, start conflicts and refuse to work them out through consensus, mistreat their compañeros. We don't have to look for them, but when we are presented with their destructive behaviors, we have to hold them accountable. Our strategies don't have to be punitive. People are entitled to their mistakes, but we should, ex we should expect that people <clears throat> will own those actions and not allow them to become a pattern. And the end. We have a right to be angry when the communities we build that are supposed to be the model for a better, more just world harbor the same kinds of anti-queer, anti-woman, racist violence that pervades society. As radical organizers, we must hold each other accountable and not enable misogynists to assert so much power in these spaces, not allowing them to be the faces, voices, and leaders of these movements, not allow them to rape a compañera and then be on the fucking five o'clock news. In Brandon Darby's case, even if no one suspected he was an informant, his domineering and macho behavior should have been all that was needed to call his leadership into question. By not allowing misogyny to take root in our communities and movements, we not only protect ourselves from the efforts of the state to destroy our work, but also create stronger movements that cannot be destroyed from within. Two footnotes there. Uh, well, two footnotes there. I use the term gender violence to refer to the ways in which homophobia and misogyny are rooted in heteronormative understandings of gender identity and gender roles. Heterosexism not only polices non-normative sexualities, but also reproduces normative gender roles and identities that reinforce the logic of patriarchy and male privilege. Two, I learned this from, inf uh, I'm not sure which uh, thing that this was a footnote off of, but anyway, I learned this from informal conversations with women who had organized with Darby in Austin and New Orleans while participating in the Austin Informants Working Group, which was formed by people who had worked with Darby and were stunned by his revelation that he was an FBI informant. So I'm guessing that that ambient ad was courtesy of like some sloppy copy pasting <laughs> into this article. But anyway, yeah, that was Courtney Desiree Morris. And I'm not sure if the blog is still up, but creolemaroon.blogspot.com. All right, let's end it there for today. I'm going to go into the chat. So we'll have some discussion of this as I'm sure people have thoughts about it. Um, but I had more articles. We'll continue those in the next stream. But let's see what's going on in the chat right now. All right. So uh, coming off of the Russia discussion, the campism has gone so far that some of these idiots literally try to say that the Russian Federation is socialist. Yeah, I, I, I haven't seen it myself at this point, but no doubt, no doubt. Here in Phoenix, they recently raised the ba the starting salary for a police officer by a whopping twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, I mean th these are the priorities of this society. Um, you know, suppressing the kind of change that people like us represent, they are willing to fund that all day long. 
The political ads in Chicago and crime news stories are going crazy to try to elect some tough on crime politicians. Really, crime should be a scathing indictment on the city's $2 billion plus police budget. A cab, yeah. Houses, jobs, and schools stop crime, not policing, and health care. The cognitive dissonance of conservatives and libertarians who cry about freedom all the time are the first to defend police brutality and are the ultimate bootlickers for the police. So yeah, this is something we talk about with libertarians a lot, is that all of their anti-war and anti-police sentiments are complete idealism because they are for capitalism. And that's what they will defend all day long and they join militias looking to defend capitalism and so on. The capitalism that they defend, the private property that is fundamental to that, requires this sort of police presence. Like that's the reason why <laughs> the, the police are there in the first place. So it's complete idealism. You can't have anti-war uh, advanced capitalism. You can't have anti-police advanced capitalism. This is These are the needs of the ruling class. And if you're going for that system, uh, it's just idealism to... Uh, I mean, the system would fall apart. Who's going to enforce that private property? So, yeah. If libertarians wanted to be consistent, they would become socialists. Or, well, what actually happens is they're more likely to become consistent by just dropping the anti-war and anti-police sentiment. But, you know, the Libertarian Party proper is... Um, they're able to hide behind the fact that they have not really attained much state power, so they don't have to be on record as supporting the wars and supporting the cops and all that shit. But... You know, if they ever were to attain more power, that's the only way you can hold capitalism together. This is what informants are told to do in the little guidebooks. Encourage people to do illegal things so that arrests can be made. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, it can be entrapment if they do it wrong, but they definitely, um, they try to do it anyway. <laughs> Let that be a reminder to register your Molotov cocktails. Yeah, that, that's a new one on me. I don't know why you'd have a uh, Molotov cocktail sitting around long enough that it would... I, it seemed to me that those are almost by nature temporary items. Like, people don't just have, like, you know, shelves full of Molotov cocktails laying around. That seems like that would be a huge liability <laughs> to, um, to whoever was storing them. But anyway. Being a fake lover for small-time protesters for a corporate state, what a pathetic existence... Yeah, so um, continuing, imagine you meet your significant other in an org and years later you find out they're an informant and this was uh, the this was the person to the whole, lighting the match to the whole org. Yeah, this has happened. I think that there was a famous case in the UK with environmental activists where a woman, uh, a female activist, was very involved with the group and some male, you know, comrade came along and got her pregnant and she drops out of the org and this and that turns out the guy was an undercover cop assigned to the group and she's literally carrying the guy's kid now so like yeah that happens that definitely happens yeah we do we do need to build community orgs I, there's a lot existing i i'm constantly encouraging people get out there and get involved with what is in your find what is in your community and help build it and you'll see, if you haven't been involved, you'll see these problems. You will see what's actually going on. And they're very challenging to face. That's why people are constantly dropping out of the movement. They get involved. They're involved for a year or two and they drop out because there's a lot of really difficult things. And, you know, kudos to the people who stand for longer than that. All of this is very related to opportunism, class collaboration, and the optics shit sock dems like Vosh and Pat Sox push. Anyone who says we can't be too hardline on issues of misogyny, homophobia, or racism because the masses aren't ready for it is damaging the movement. Do not kowtow to the right. Our base is in the most oppressed, not the people made uncomfortable, even by simply referencing such you know, race-based oppression, gender-based oppression, etc., Absolutely. Absolutely. This is why, you know, we fought that stuff so much, because it literally is just going to drive people out of the movement. It does the work of the cops, whether they're cops or not. I mean, we know a lot of these people basically are tied to the LaRouche movement, Schiller Institute. 
And uh, that makes a lot of sense in hindsight because LaRouche would be an informant um, and share intelligence with governments. You know, that was part of what they did. So that's not surprising at all. You see people like Infracell and Maupin and stuff pushing these, you know, basically coddling racism, coddling anti-Semitism, coddling sexism. Um, that's what they're that, that's what they're there to do. And it, it's massively disruptive to the movement. Um, I had no idea about this history. Thanks for covering this. Patriarchy and left parties here seems as deep seated as caste in India. We can't compromise on these issues, even with people as idolized as Huey. Yes. The Cuban revolutionaries dealt with very similar issues, machismo, homophobia, and such. Yeah, machismo, also known as male chauvinism and such. Luckily, they mostly overcame it, but there's still work to be done, obviously. Basically, you can take the pig out of the pig pen. Well, you can take the pig pen out of the pig, but it, you know, we get stamped by the society that we're socialized into. So, you know, it depends partly whether you had radical parents, whether you had conservative parents, whatever. Um, that may give you sort of a leg up or a disadvantage. But yeah, I mean, as we become communists and we start to do this work, it, it's got to happen fast. Otherwise, you're going to be um and yeah weirdest place for an ambient ad that was bizarre i guess it was, they said it was um on facebook and things like that i wonder if it just got copy pasted sloppily from that but anyway uh yeah by the time that you become a communist and you're becoming active in organizations you've got to make it an absolute priority otherwise you will wind up wrecking the uh the org in one way or another or you it may not be actively you who's out there um womanizing or whatever but you could be the one that is turning a blind eye to it or you could be the one where somebody says something to you like hey so and so did this or said this and you might explain it away or whatever and that helps to destroy the organization as well because it it's just horrible for everyone involved and i'll tell you after, you know from a lot of experience people do come out of organizations like that with really uh, you know, huge, it affects people deeply because when people get involved in parties and organizations of this type, it's a risk in the first place. First of all, to have um, gotten fired enough, fired up enough to care about this stuff to the point where you're going to join something, you're going to volunteer your time, your energy, all this stuff on doing this work of trying to change the world and you're opposing, you know, if you're doing it in the U.S., you're opposing like the you know biggest imperialist system in the world and and all that stuff and then to ha be treated badly within the organization that's when i say that being in the wrong org can be life shattering uh really so comment i'm in a group in myanmar mostly mls this type of stuff is very common transphobia especially yeah i mean i've been attacking this stuff since late 2020 and you know people's ignorant responses to this have gotten a lot of people banned. Unfortunately, I can't push back on it in all of the ways that I would like. I can't have, you know, dialogues with tons of anonymous people who, I don't know, you know, might be literal like paid cops at a troll farm. I don't know, but we can address it in content. And, you know, we've done some of this indirectly through the Pat Sock discussions, talking about people like Maupin and Infracell and why they're wrong. But, uh, you know, some of that is just about nationalism and politics and war but like obviously you know in the case of infracell the reason that i call it that is because it comes out of those like manosphere like uh incel spaces basically completely alienated from women steeped in this absurd self-destructive machismo that's just literally comical to the point but there are men who make it work better for them that don't come off looking like complete clowns and are able to um you know, tone it down where they make their uh, male chauvinism and sexism presentable. And, you know, women, some women actually go for it, unlike the incels where it just doesn't really work for them at all. Um, you know, which is, I mean, watch the video that we did on that, the like incel, it's really an ideology. I mean, there's a lot of people have like narcissistic personalities that are involved with that, which, you know, so they're kind of pathological on that level, but it's also an ideology that's tied in with all of this, uh, sexism so anyway yeah it's it is way too common and it's part of the reason why we're not as far along as we should be 
Another comment. I joined the PCUSA. That is a group that splintered off of CPUSA in the last decade. Uh, a while ago, and within months, this exact sort of shit cropped up. As it happens, I had already left for other reasons. But when I heard that, I knew I made the right choice. Uh, for And somebody says, for every reactionary like these, you, you lose countless real comrades. And the person talking about PC, PCUSA said exactly this. This is exactly what I'm saying. Our base is in these real comrades among the most oppressed. Growth does not come by constantly tailing white hetero men and their bullshit. So many, quote, communists uphold an image of the working class that is literally just your stereotypical reactionary white guy. Yeah. And it's true. How many people have been driven away by that kind of thing? Oh, the pig in the pen comment was about police and organizations. Yeah, also thinking about uh, Vosh, who has sexually harassed some young girls. That guy's entire behavior, and you look at the following that he's got, it's exactly this stuff to a T. It's absolutely disgusting. I mean, let alone the... I mean, you mentioned young girls. Uh, I think he's harassed women of various ages, but the whole thing about the young, the youth... I mean, the stuff that guy goes into, I don't know how you can get away with the stuff that he says and not be on the payroll. Personally, that's my opinion. Um, he says stuff that is just illegal um, constantly. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and w when you criticize some of these people, they just do these like bizarre ad homs like uh, it's, it's just pure pure projection. But anyway, I mean, people like an infracell. They're a fucking clown and they're online and they have no reach in the real world. Unfortunately, you know, that isn't the extent of the problem. There's, like I said, people who are smoother, who put this into some kind of real world practice and then wind up uh, being really destructive in real life. So anyway, we're going to leave it there for today. We're going to continue on this topic uh, tomorrow. More specifically, like less on the, uh, well, there's elements of it, but not another article specifically about the misogyny connection, but just generally, you know, how, how do you spot people who are disrupting your organization, etc., as well as other topics. So we will go from there. Thanks again to the patrons, patreon.com slash socialism for all. Thanks to everybody who showed up in the chat. We got 36 people um, in there today.